last chapter of the last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11 is a fascinating verse. It says that one day soon, Jesus is going to finish his work in that sanctuary in heaven that we've been looking at. He's going to stand up and say, this is it. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who does right continue to do right. Let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. Sometime, and we don't know how long, but sometime before Jesus comes, he will say, the righteous stay righteous, the holy stay holy, the wicked stay wicked, I am coming soon. In other words, before Jesus comes, the three angels' messages will sound to the whole world. Every living person on earth is going to have the opportunity to hear the truth about God. The mark of the beast will be enforced. Everyone will be forced to choose. Worship God, the creator, or the beast, the creature. Everyone will have been called to come out of Babylon and worship the creator. God will have done everything that he could possibly do, and that's when he says, it's over. The wicked stay wicked, the righteous stay righteous. There will be no more crossing over after that point that takes place sometime before Jesus comes. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I'm coming soon. So Jesus is saying to the church, the time is coming when I'll say the wicked stay wicked, the righteous stay righteous, and then I'm going to come. You see, by the time Jesus comes for his church, there will be no more opportunity to change over, no more opportunity to get saved. Anyone that's going to get saved better do it now because then it's going to be too late. And just as a little aside, don't let anyone try to tell you that it's all happened in the past that Jesus has already come. Don't let anybody try to tell you that because if Jesus has already come, then he has already said, the wicked stay wicked, the righteous stay righteous, and no one can change over so you and I would have no hope. Don't let anybody tell you that after Jesus comes for the church, there'll be a second chance because the wicked are going to have an opportunity to respond to 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are left behind. Don't let anybody tell you that because before Jesus comes for his church, the wicked stay wicked, the righteous stay righteous, and Jesus says, I am coming soon. There will be no crossing over. If you're going to get right with God, folks, you need to do it now. So the question is, what will you be doing when Je Jesus finally says it's finished? The righteous stay righteous. Wicked stay wicked. If they're going to stay wicked, that means they can't get saved. If they're going to stay righteous, then they can't get lost. They're done. They're sealed. They're finished. What are you going to be doing on that day? It could happen at any time. It could be any day. It can be doing, what are you going to be doing? Do you want to know? Because the Bible tells us. Turn to Luke. Turn to the, the Gospel of Luke, 17th chapter. 
in Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also to be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying, given in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting, building. But the day that Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. So on that day, what is it going to be like? What are you going to be doing? It will be just like it was in the days of Noah, like it was in the days of Lot. Well, what were they doing then? They were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building, marrying, giving in marriage. What's wrong with all those things? Nothing is wrong with those things. You see, that's the very point. On that day, it will be business as usual. The things you're doing now are the things that you will probably be doing then, business as usual. We're creatures of habit. We don't like to change things. You even sit in the same seats every night. We like to do things the same way all the time. You know that. That's the way we are. And to change churches, to change beliefs, to switch from Sab Sunday to Sabbath, it's not easy. We're creatures of habit. And when someone comes along and suggests a better way, we resist that. That's why he said it'll be business as usual. We're going to be doing the same things we do right now, just like it was in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? Noah. What a man. He had a revelation now that lasted 120 years. <laughs> and you're getting tired after four weeks. <laughs> 120 years Noah preached that God was going to destroy this world by flood. 120 years. He believed it. He believed it so much that he built an ark, a big boat, and God provided a way through that ark for the people that wanted to, to trust him to be saved. And Noah preached his heart out. He was a righteous man, the Bible says. Yet after 120 years, he stood in the doorway to that ark and he made his last altar call. Only seven people came. And there was his whole family. Just seven people family members. I get discouraged sometimes when it doesn't seem as though the Holy Spirit's working fast enough and I want to see more people following the Lamb. I get a little discouraged. But Noah, 120 years. Now, I know that his sermons had to have been the most powerful sermons anyone ever heard that was listening to him. It had to make sense. I'm sure that there were a lot of people who heard Noah preach and would go away saying, I have never heard the truth so clearly before. I have never heard anything like this. And every single word lined up with Scripture. And he compared Scripture with Scripture and backed up everything he said with the Word of God. What power! I'm sure a lot of people that heard him walked away thinking just that. But when they started talking to other people about this, they would hear things like, Oh, don't listen to that guy. Man, he's some kind of a nutcase. 
They go talking to their pastors. What about it? Oh, that little old church. Are you trying to tell me you got to join that old boat church up on the hill in order to get saved? And the rain, the flood, there had never been a drop of rain on the earth before. How's he going to get that much water to flood the earth? And there are a lot of other boats around. We'll just make our own little rowboat here and we'll be okay. Noah even preached that the animals were going to come out and go up into the ark and God was going to save some animals. How are you going to do that, Noah? How are you going to get the animals to come up out of the woods? And what are you going to do when you get all the lions and the tigers and the sheep and the goat? They're going to eat them all up. Maybe you too. And here, Noah, here's a butterfly net. Go catch some birds to put in there too. You can have some fun. Oh, I'm sure they had fun with the old man. Telling everybody, don't listen to him as a call. Listen to me. As they went and talked to their pastors, I guarantee I wasn't there, but I know this because I've been doing this long enough and I know they heard something like this. Noah, he's the only guy. If he was right, we would all be preaching that. You mean to say that he's right and everybody else is wrong? Come on now. Noah was the only man on this planet that had it right. Everybody else was wrong. And I want to tell you something. It wasn't long until everybody on earth became a believer. Some were inside the ark, some were outside the ark, but they all came a believer. Only difference is that some were too late. And the time is coming when everybody on this planet is once again going to be a believer. Then maybe there were those who said, well, I believe him, but I'm going to wait until I see those animals come. Then I'll go. When the prophecy starts being fulfilled, I'm going to go. I hear that today, too. Well, I'm glad I learned those things, how all the churches are going to join together and how it's starting to happen. When I see that happen, when they get together, I'm going to take my stand. It's going to be business as usual, just like it was in the days of Noah. Eight people in that boat, Noah's family. They saw... One day, they saw the animals coming out of the woods and walking right up the gangplank into that boat, and not one person changed their mind. They saw prophecy fulfill. They saw a miracle with their own eyes. No one changed their mind. Why not? Because it was business as usual, just like it was in the days of Noah. 18 May, 1980. You know what happened. Wasn't that far from here. Mount St. Helens had been spewing a little bit of steam and ash and lava around, and they were saying, she's going to blow. And they started warning people to leave the area. A lot of people left. But you saw him. I saw him. Harry Truman I've been here 50 years and I'm not leaving for anything. And he's still there under Spirit Lake right now. You see, we don't want to change. We just like it where we are. And it's difficult. When people come along and say, hey, that mountain's going to blow. You better get out of here. No. I'm not moving. And when somebody comes along and says, hey, this world's about to blow. The churches are lining up. 
and they're all being influenced to turn against God and rebel against his law. You got to change, man. You got to go, oh, it's just too hard for me. Too hard for me. Business as usual. That's the way it was in the days of Noah. Pompeii, 79 AD. Same thing, volcano, Mount Vesuvius, starting to give signs it was going to blow, and it blew. And people had time to leave. Some did, but many, many were left behind. My wife and I had the opportunity to visit a museum in Dallas that had managed to get some of the artifacts that had been excavated from Pompeii. And so while we were there, we went down, drove down to Dallas, went to the museum, and it was unbelievable. The art objects, the sculpture, left nothing to your imagination. It was easy to figure out why God let Pompeii blow up like that. Almost like USA Today. Somebody once said, if God doesn't hurry and come, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah and Pompeii. <laughs> the exhibit that caught my attention more than anything else, and it's still indelible in my mind, was the very last one at the door on the way out. It was a large, two large glass cases. You see, when they excavated Pompeii, they discovered some empty shell-like holes where people had been. And they were just a handful of dust down in the bottom of this hole. So they filled some of those holes with plaster of Paris, and, and after it got hard, they chipped away the stone and were left with a replica, a perfect replica of that individual trapped at the moment of their death. And the two that we saw were a man and a woman. The first one was a woman. They found her laying across the doorstep to her house. She had had the opportunity to escape, but she went back into her house to get something. That's what the sign said above the exhibit. Because they found her laying across her doorstep with a tiny pearl earring clutched tightly in each fist. She had the opportunity to go, but she went back to get those little earrings. People will die for what they have been living for all along. That's human nature. That's why it's business as usual. And then the other one was a man that they found. He was trying to get away. He was running down the, the, the street, the center of town in Pompeii, but he couldn't go fast enough because he was carrying this big heavy chest full of gold and silver and precious gems. It slowed him down and it cost him his life. People will die for what they've been living for all along. On that day, it will be business as usual, just like it was in the days of Noah. They saw a miracle. But nobody changed their mind. Balaam, a fascinating story about human nature in Numbers chapter 22. Numbers, the 22nd chapter, in verse 3, the Bible says, Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. So the Israelites were going through the wilderness, through the desert. They were coming up on Moab. Moab heard all the stories about what they had done to the other countries, and they were shaken in their boots, scared to death. So Balak, in verse 5, Balak, son of Zippor, who was the king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, the son of Beor, who was a prophet. So King Balak sent messengers to go get Balaam, who was a prophet. So they went to Balaam, verse 6. And they gave him the message from the king. Now come and put a curse on these people because they're too powerful for me. Perhaps then I'll be able to defeat them and drive them out of the country. Now Balaam was a prophet. 
He had to know that it certainly wasn't God's plan to curse his own people. He knew that. But he was tempted by a reward from the king. And so Balaam told them. He said in verse 8, Spend the night here, Balaam said. I'll bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. In other words, he told him, I'm going to go pray. You stay here overnight. That's all right. I'm going to go pray. I'm going to seek God's will. And then I'll see whatever God says, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to seek God's will. So he goes and he prays. Now he should have known God's will. <laughs> He's not going to curse his own people. He says, I'm going to seek God's will. He prayed. Verse 12, God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they're blessed. Now is there anything difficult to understand about that? Is there anything confusing about that? God is always clear and simple. Balaam even understood it. See, it's not complicated when you look at God's will. It gets complicated when you start looking around and listening to what everybody else is saying. So what's the lesson? The lesson is quit listening around and keep your nose in the Word of God. <laughs> Balaam? Don't go with them, God said. Next morning, verse 13, Balaam got up and he went to Balak's princes. He said, go back to your own country. The Lord has told me to, not to, let, to go with you. Now that, I mean, that's, Balaam understood what God was saying. He knew God's will. Verse 15, but Balak, the king of Moab, Balak sent other princes more numerous than the first, more distinguished even. They came to Balaam and they said in verse 16, This is what Balak, son of Zippor, says, Don't let anything keep you from coming to me, because I'll reward you handsomely, and I'll do whatever you say. Come put a curse on these people. Now I have to confess that I've never been tempted by a king offering me anything I wanted. I've never been tempted like that. Maybe we should be a little understanding of Balaam. But in verse 19, he said, Well, you stay here tonight like the others did, and I'll find out what else the Lord will tell me. In other words, I'm going to go pray about this. I want to seek God's will. Was he really seeking God's will? Why did he say, I'll find out what else? the Lord will tell me. Why do you say, what else? Because the Lord had already told him not to go. And so if he's wanting to see what else God's going to say, that means that he's hoping that God will change his mind and let him go. He wasn't seeking God's will. He was seeking his own will. He prayed, God, what do you want me to do? Now here's the scary part. That night the Lord came to Balaam, verse 20, and he said, go with him. Go with him. So Balaam says, oh, yay, whoopee. I know God's will now. <laughs> so it tells us. Balaam got up in the morning, verse 21, he saddled his donkey and he went with the princes of Moab. Verse 22, but God was very angry at him. Wow. Wow. God said, go, and then he gets angry at Balaam for going. Why? God doesn't work by force. God works by love. He's not going to force anyone. He's not going to force you to follow him. He's not going to force you to worship him. He'll woo you to love him and trust him. Balaam was showing. He knew God's will. God had made it crystal clear. But he was showing that he trusted himself more than he trusted God. And God isn't going to force. He's going to say, hey, go your way. It breaks his heart. But he's not going to make us obey. He's not going to make you change your life. He's not going to make you keep the Sabbath. It has to be your choice. 
Balaam made the wrong choice. God wasn't happy, but he had to let him go. Now, I want to tell you something. On the surface, it looked like Balaam was a spiritual man. I mean, he went to seek God's will. He went to pray. God, what do you want me to do? But I'm telling you, it is dangerous to seek God's will when you already know what God's will is. Sometimes people come to Revelation now and I say, oh, I've studied, I've learned so many new things, I should be baptized the Bible way, and when I got sprinkled, it didn't really count for baptism because it wasn't immersed. Or I've learned about the Sabbath, and, and, and it's on the seventh day. Oh, this has been a good experience. Well, that's wonderful. I'm not interested in just teaching you stuff. I want you to follow the Lamb. And sometimes I ask, well, what, you know, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to pray about that, Pastor. I'm going to see what God wants me to do. See what God wants me to do. 400 times, over 400 times in the Bible, God says, keep my commands, keep my laws, over 400 times. And we need to pray and say, God, what do you want me to do? He's going to tell you, go your way. Balaam did. He went his own way. God was angry sent his angel out to oppose him. Verse 23, the donkey saw the angel standing in the road with a sword in his hand. And so she turned off the road into a field. Balaam didn't even see it. He was so possessed with his own desires, with his own evil desires. He was so possessed with what he wanted. He was blind to the intervention of God. He didn't see it. The donkey saw it and Balaam got angry and beat his donkey. Got her back on the road. And then the angel stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with a wall on both sides. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. She pressed close to the wall, smashing Balaam's foot up against the wall. Oh, Balaam got angry again. He beat that donkey again. And then in verse 27, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in a narrow spot where he, it was too tight. He couldn't get around either side. Poor donkey didn't know what to do, so she just lay down in the road. Balaam got so angry, he was beside himself now. He got his stick, the Bible says, and he began to beat her with his stick. And then in verse 28, the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you these three times to make you beat me like this? Haven't I always been a good donkey? Now, you would think, you would think that Balaam would suspect something unusual happening here. <laughs> but the Bible says in verse 29, Balaam answered the donkey. so possessed with his own evil desires that he turned around and talked back to that dumb beast. You made a fool of me, he said. If I had a sword in my hand, I'll kill you by now. Verse 31, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell to the ground, face down. And the angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I came here to oppose you. But because your path is a reckless one before me. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I've sinned. I have sinned. I didn't realize you're standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if 
you are displeased, I'll go back. If you are displeased, I stood in the road with my sword, draw, sword drawn. I would have killed you these three times if your donkey hadn't have seen me. And now, if you're wanting me to, I'll go back. You would think that Balaam would have got back on that little donkey, turned her around as fast as her legs would take him home. But the Bible says, the angel told him, Go with the men. So Balaam went. Unbelievable. After all of that, Balaam went. Unbelievable. Or is it? On that day, eating, drinking, buying, selling, building, planting, marrying, giving in marriage, it will be business as usual. Balaam didn't change. Most of us don't change. It's hard to change. Balaam heard a miracle. In the days of Noah, they saw a miracle. None of them changed. Last minute deathbed conversions rare they happen praise the Lord sometimes they happen but it's dangerous to count on it it's dangerous to plan on it why because we are creatures of habit it's business as usual and furthermore can we say no to God when he appeals to our hearts can we say, no, God, not yet? No, God, I, I'm not ready yet. No, God, I got a few more things I need to do. No, God, please, later. Paul made an impassioned appeal to King Agrippa. Now is the time to accept Jesus. And King Agrippa said in Acts 26, 28, he said, Paul, you have almost persuaded me. You came close. Oh, I'm right there. But we never read where he was ever persuaded. We can come close, but unless we take that next step and change in our lives, then we never read where he was persuaded. Paul appeared before the governor, Felix, made an impassioned appeal. appeal, And Felix said, makes sense. It's not a good time right now. Call me at a convenient season. And we never read where that convenient season ever came. And a lot of people tell me, <laughs> I'm close, Pastor, but I got a few things I need to get worked out first. It's just not quite the right time for me yet. Folks, if we don't do it now, and the Bible says the likelihood of doing it later is pretty, pretty slim. We need to make our business be God's business right now. We can't keep saying no to God, no to God, no God later. After a while, Lord, I got a few things I need to get worked out right. And then when we decide it's time, say, here I am, God. Because the Bible tells us Jesus himself said, John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I'm going to show you in our next lesson that the time's coming soon when the Spirit will stop drawing people to God. We can't come to Jesus when we decide it's time to come. We can't say, well, it's not right for me yet. When the Spirit of God convicts our heart, we need to respond then. Because the time's coming when He's not going to be tugging at our hearts anymore. be business as usual, just like it was in the days of Lot. What was it like in the days of Lot? Genesis, the 18th chapter. Abraham sitting under a shade tree in the desert when the Lord appeared before him. And he said, Abraham, verse 20, 
The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous. I'm going to go down there and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. Then I'll know. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Did God have to go down there to see how bad it was? He knew how bad it was. So why did he say to Abraham, I'm going to go down there and see if it's as bad as what it sounds like from up there? Why did he say that? Because there was someone else who needed to be convinced that God, who was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, was doing the right thing. And so Abraham said to the Lord, verse 23, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people there? Far be it from you, the end of verse 25, Far be it from you, Lord. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? You need to stop for a second and think about what's going on here. God has just announced to Abraham, I'm going to go check on Sodom and Gomorrah and see if they're as bad as it sounds like. Sounds like a judgment kind of time to me. I'm going to go down there and see what they're doing and weigh it out to see if they really deserve to be destroyed or not. A judgment time. And Abraham comes along and he says, Lord, will you take the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people there? Are you going to sweep it away? Far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham was scared to death that God was about to do something that would show that he was unfair. That's the whole picture right there in this little story, the whole picture of what we've been talking about all along from Genesis 3.15 when God promised a serpent he would send his seed to crush the serpent's head all the way through to Revelation when we discover there in the great judgment day that God demonstrates once and for all when he saves the righteous and destroys the wicked. He's doing the right thing. Abraham gives us a peek at that great judgment day right now back in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. Won't the judge of all the earth do right? God has to demonstrate that when he finally wraps this thing up and brings it to a close, he's doing the right thing. He's not going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked. What a, what a story. And so God says, no. If they're 50, I won't destroy the city. Abraham started counting them up. He couldn't come up with 50. Is what that five left? No, 45 I won't destroy. Well, what if there are 30 there? 35? No, no, I won't. 30? No, 20? No, 10? No, I won't. He says, don't be angry at me. God, don't be angry at me. What if there are only 10? <laughs> now, I don't know why he stopped at 10. <laughs> maybe he felt like he pushed God too far already. Or maybe he thought, surely, surely there are 10. But the truth is there weren't even four. Not even four. Chapter 19, verse 1, the two angels arrived in Sodom. And Lot, that's Abraham's nephew, who had come down with Abraham when he went to the land and settled in Sodom, he was sitting in the gateway of the city. Now that's more than just sitting in the shade of the gate with a little thing over your head. That meant that he was an important person in the community. He sat on the city council, for example. And so he's sitting there. He's in the gateway of the city. And these two angels are coming in. And, and they see him. And he says, my lords. They look like men. He says, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. You come to my house. You can wash your feet there and spend the night. No, they said, we want to go to the square. We want to see what Sodom is like. And, and, and Lot says, oh, oh, you don't want to do that. It's a wicked place. You don't want to be there in the square after it gets so Yeah, we want to go to the square. We want to see Sodom. So Lot insisted so strongly, verse 3, that they did go with him, and they went to his house. Now, when they're sitting around the supper table eating, all the men from the city, young and old, it says, surrounded the house. And they called out to Lot, Where are those men who came to you tonight? Bring them out here to us so that we can have sex with them. And that gives you a little idea of what Sodom was like. Lot went outside to meet them. He says, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Now, these were his friends. 
No, don't do this wicked thing. Who do you think you are? Get out of our way. We'll treat you worse than we would them. And the angels inside, verse 10, they had to reach out there and pull Lot back into the house and shut the door. And then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness. Now you would think, after being struck blind, that they would suspect something unusual going on here. But the Bible says they didn't. They wearied themselves groping for the door. So possessed with their own evil desires, they were blind to the divine intervention of God. See, that's human nature. We can't even see unless we submit to God. We can't even see that we're doing wrong. You can read it in the Bible. You can understand it. You can say it back and memorize it and quote it. But unless we're willing to submit to God to change our lives, we'll never see it. Blind to the intervention of God. Wearied themselves, groping for the door. And so then the two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, sons, sons-in-laws, daughters, daughter-in-laws, anybody else in this city that belongs to you? Get them out of here because we're going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great, he sent us to destroy it. Verse 14, so Lot went out and he spoke to his sons, his, 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 his daughters, his sons. He, he, he went to his children, to his family. In the middle of the night, Dad, well, what, what, you know what time it is? What are you doing here now? God's going to destroy Sodom tonight. We need to get out of here. Pack up. Get your stuff. Come on. Let's go. He says they thought he was joking. They thought he was joking. Dad, you can't be serious. God doesn't expect us to get out of here in the middle of the night and leave our houses. The looters will come take everything we have and, and just leave like that. No, God isn't that way. He's not that rash and, and unreasonable. Surely he would give us a lot of time and a lot of warning. We need to think about it a little bit, prepare for it. Besides that, Dad, you're always telling us the stories about how you and Uncle Abraham left to come down here and how God led you and he led you right here to settle in these cities. If God led us here, then why would he want us to uproot and go somewhere else? No, Dad, you just had a bad day. Why don't you go home and take an aspirin or two? You'll feel better in the morning. He goes to another daughter. Oh, Dad, you got to be kidding me. You want me to get up and get the kids and leave? You know, my husband's not one of us. He's a good man. Does a lot of good things. He works for the Red Cross and he helps people. But he doesn't believe like we do. I just need a little more time. And besides that, he also has a little bit of a temper. Well, he'd tear this place apart if I just packed up and took the kids out like that. And surely God wouldn't want me to just leave him behind. You see, we can have all kinds of reasons to not do what God says. And they always make sense. Poor Lot. He's not sure what to do, but he goes to the next one. Same thing, Dad. you got to be kidding me. Look at all the good people here. No, they don't believe the way we do, but they're good people. And they go to that temple and they worship their gods every week. Not, not the God, but, you know, they're doing okay. He's not going to destroy them, is he? Maybe they keep the wrong day. They don't do it like he says, but he's not going to destroy them for that. And besides that, Dad, we just bought that big plot of land on the west side of town. We we're going to build a big mall, remember? We make a lot of money, and, and we give more to the church that way. Surely God would want that. Poor Lot. He went home at night, and the Bible said he hesitated. Verse 16. Sat down in his big easy chair, his mind whirling, 
didn't know what he was going to do. He hesitated. And I love this part of the story. When he hesitated, the men took his hands in the hands of his wife and two daughters and led him safely out of the city. God uses people to save people. He took them by the hands. It's time to go. We need to get out of here. Come on, let's go. Sometimes some of you feel like, preacher, you're coming on too strong. Back off a little bit. I can't help it. God uses people. You think he uses me? He uses you? Don't be upset if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I know it's hard to make a change. I know that you have a lot of friends there. and It's difficult. But God's going to destroy this place. We need to get out of here. Won't you come with us? Don't resent that. God uses people to reach people. And so they took him by the hands. Lot and his wife and his two daughters and led him out to the very edge of the city and said, flee for your lives. Don't look back. They took him just so far, but the next step was up to Lot and his wife. God can't force us. And I'm sure that it was not easy for Lot as he stood there on the edge of the city. All the years and everything that he had worked for and built up was behind him. There was nothing for him out there. Don't even look back. Just flee for your life. Oh, it couldn't have been easy. But he had a daughter in each hand. And that first step, I'm sure, was a deliberate, difficult, painful step, just like it is for some of you. But the more he went, the more he realized the grace, the love of God. And those steps got easier and easier and easier. He and his two daughters fled for their lives. There was somebody else there that night, Mrs. Lot. And she's standing at the edge of the city. And she has to make her own mind. Husbands can't save wives. Wives can't save husbands. She had to decide for herself. Her husband was going. Two daughters were going. But everything she had was back there. Big, brand new, biggest house in Sodom. Brand new. Lot just built it. Three brand new camels parked in the garage. <laughs> Her daughter was about to get married. They had the biggest wedding plan that Sodom had ever seen. Rented the biggest hall in town. It was going to be something. And the more she thought about it, the more she realized this is just too hard for me. I can't do it. She was torn, wanting to go, wanting to stay. Have you ever felt torn like that? Pulled in one direction and then the other. Some of you are right there. You're being tugged to follow the lamb, but then everybody is saying, no, you don't need to do that. And you're torn. Finally, she realized, I just can't do it. I can't go on. She turned to look back and froze into a pillar of salt. Lot's wife was right there. Just one step. But it was business as usual for her. And now she's an eternal reminder for everyone who has come so close. But they couldn't take the next step. Some of you are right there. You have been studying and you know it's right. Because it all comes straight from the word of God. But yet there's that attachment. 
to where we've been going and what we did before and we're feeling tugged to the old church new church pulling the lamb pulling one way and everything inside of us pulling the other way God knows it's like that he understands you he'll strengthen you but you gotta ask him he's so close don't look back just look ahead and follow the lamb well Lord we thank you we're living in a tough world. We're living in a world where sometimes even the people dearest to our hearts are tugging at us in the wrong direction. And it's never easy to follow the Lamb. Oh, we can sit here in our padded pews and say amen, amen. But when we get outside the walls and start facing the realities of life, it's never easy. And some tonight, Lord, are so close, standing right on the edge of that city, I just pray that you'll strive with their hearts. Let them take that step. Let them move forward. Let them follow the Lamb. While every head is bowed, every eye closed in prayer, I just want to take just, it's not going to be a long invitation, but just a few minutes to give some of you an opportunity to respond because some have been hesitating, just like Lot when he sat down in that big easy chair. I want to give you an opportunity to get out of that chair and to stand up and to take your stand for Jesus. Come down to the front. It's like standing at the edge of the city. Take that step. Come down. And by coming down, you're saying, Lord, I'm following you. I don't care what happens. I don't care who's trying to get me to do anything else. Lord, I'm following you. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus before. I want you to come right now. Maybe you have. You've wandered off far from where God wants you to be. You need to come back right now, today, right now. Maybe you've been a Christian all along, but you've learned some new things. You've learned some new things, and you need to take a stand. Could be lifestyle issues, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, whatever. Could be a baptism, to be baptized like Jesus was. Could be to keep the Lord's Day holy. You've got people tugging in one direction, saying it's not important, and Jesus saying, if you love me, keep my commands. could be to be part of a church It's not afraid to pick up the three angels' messages and proclaim it to the whole world. Whatever God is saying to you, won't you just respond right now? Would you do that? Just stand right now. Hello, I'm Lynn Bryson, pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in McMinnville, Oregon, where we've been filming this Revelation Now series on this set that you've been watching on your television. You may have some questions right now. And perhaps you'd like to receive Jesus in your heart, but you're not quite sure how to do that. If that's your desire, then I invite you to bow your head with me and pray and repeat the words after me. Dear Lord and Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. I want to invite him into my heart right now. Please come in and forgive me for my sins. And thank you for the free gift of salvation. I know that Jesus is preparing a place for me in your house. And I'm eager to see you. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, then congratulations, because you have received Jesus into your heart. Now you may be wondering right now, what am I supposed to feel? Or perhaps you're feeling a peace coming into you that you've never felt before. Both are normal. Don't rely on your feelings, though. Believe God's word and believe that what he has said is true, that he loves you and that he has forgiven you. This is the perfect time to find answers to some of your questions. And if you do have questions, I would invite you to locate a Seventh-day Adventist church in your local area. Seventh-day Adventist churches are listed in the phone books, and you can find one by going to the yellow pages or the white pages. Or you can get on the Internet and do a Google search for Seventh-day Adventist churches. Or you may want to just go ahead and call the McMinnville Church right here in Oregon. If you're calling from the United States, our phone number is 503-472-7841. Or you could email us at sdachurch at onlinemac.com. Or go to our webpage at www.mcminnvilleadventist.org. These are the most exciting days to be alive in. These are the days the prophets saw in vision and wished they could have been alive for. 
Jesus is about to come. In the meantime, he can give you a peace of heart to give you trust daily as you pray to him and come to him with your concerns. In the meantime, remember to always look to him in faith and follow the Lamb. Lord, we send our prayers up to you, praying for you to touch the hearts of those who have a decision to make. Some have told me, and yet they still hesitate. So, Lord, I just pray that you'll strive with their hearts. And let there be no rest. As long as that door stands open, Lord, let them come before the big door of the ark swings shut for the last time. And I thank you for each person who has given their heart to you. Up until now, we've seen many, Lord, some for the first time and some just rededicating, but we rejoice for each one. And I know all heaven rejoices right now. So, Lord, we thank you and praise you for all that you've done and help us to continue to follow the Lamb. Amen.